Hey, Cornerstone, it is so good to be with you. I'm so excited to be with you today. I am so excited with the message that God has for you and me today. So I was about 14 years old, probably in eighth grade. I, I went through this huge growth spurt. I was probably like five feet, eight inches tall. I probably weighed about 110, 120 pounds. I had a couple of whiskers growing on my chin. And I started thinking pretty highly of myself. I was thinking I was pretty big stuff. Now, you need to understand, my dad, he was a strict disciplinarian. But at this time, my parents had been fighting a lot. In fact, they were a few months away from getting divorced. And so between me thinking I was a big man now and my parents fighting, I thought I might have a little leeway in how I treated or how I spoke to my mother. So on this particular day, we were standing in the kitchen, and she asked me a question. Well, not really asked me a question. You know how parents will ask you something, but it's more of a statement. She said, uh, Patrick, would you unload the dishwasher? I knew she wasn't asking, she knew she wasn't asking, everyone in the kitchen knew she wasn't asking. But I looked at her and I said, no. Now she's a little five foot petite thing, and I'm all of five eight now, you know. No. Well, my father got up in my face and said something to me. Can you guess what he might have said? It's okay to repeat it in church, by the way. Can you guess what he might have said? In fact, maybe you want to turn to someone sitting next to you and just guess. What do you think he said? Or just mumble it out loud. Maybe, what is something a parent might say in that situation? Go, oh, wow, we got, <laughs> we got a lot of opinions here. Let me tell you what he said. He got up in my face and he said, Patrick, who do you think you are? Anybody get close to that in your guess? Okay, some of you. Who do you think you are? Now, I know he wasn't waiting for a response. I know he wasn't asking me a question. It was more of a statement. He's saying, you're the son, she's the mother, you will respect and honor her. But all these years later, I look back on that statement slash question, and I think it might be one of the most, quest most important questions that you and I ask ourselves. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Let me rephrase this. Who am I? Who am I? Who are you? A, a little over 10 years ago, I was in the gym working out, and, and I left my locker for just a moment, and my wallet was stolen with all of my identification, my, my photo ID, my credit cards. How many of you have ever had identity theft? Raise your hand. Okay. There's quite a few in here. You know what a pain it is, right? Because over the next few weeks, I would go to get ID, and I would hear the same thing over and over again. Well, I'm sorry, you can't get identification without identification. I'm like, well, how do I do that? My identification was stolen. I'm sorry, you can't get photo ID without photo ID, but I have to get photo ID to get photo ID. You know what a pain it is. But I would suggest to you and I that there's an identification theft, identif an identification theft that has taken place in your life and my life that goes far deeper than just someone stealing our driver's license or our credit cards. In fact, this identification theft affects how we see ourselves, how we see others, and ultimately how we see God. We're three weeks into the series called Devil Games, and if you were here the last two weeks, Lynn has established the fact that the devil, Satan, the demons, they're not something that's made up. It's not some made-up thing. The devil is a real identity. identity. He, he is true. He is as, as real as this hand. He is as real as this Bible. And he is our enemy, and I don't say this lightly. I'm not saying this crassly. He is our enemy that is hell-bent on destroying us. He is hell-bent on destroying us. John 10, 10, Jesus said, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. His only goal for you and me is to steal, kill, and destroy what God has for us. And his, one of his number one ways in doing that is to steal our identity. Because he knows it affects how we see ourselves, how we see others, and how ultimately we see God. Now, I'm excited today because we're going to take a, a quick trip through like 5,000 years of history. Woohoo! And if you have your Bibles, good luck, because what I did today is I just printed off these verses, and I just slid them in my Bible, because I'm going to go all over the place, and I'm not even going to be able to keep up if I was flipping around. So if you, want, if you want a challenge, try to keep up with me today, okay? 
But before we go there, will you just pray with me? Because I want to pause and ask God to speak to us. This is so important that you and I get the truths that God wants us to get today. God, help us. Speak to us, please. I pray. I plead with you. I beg you, God. Open our hearts and minds to get this today. We love you, Jesus. Amen. So the first place we're going to is John chapter 8. John chapter 8, Jesus is, is, is challenging the religious leaders. He's having an argument with the religious leaders of his day. Now, here's what's interesting. Many of you in here or listening online, you've heard the Bible stories enough that you kind of know them. But try to pretend for just a moment that you know nothing about this. And for the very first time, you're hearing that 2,000 years ago, God left his throne and put on flesh and came to earth. And he lived here about 30-some years. The last four years of that time, he began to publicly proclaim him, himself as the Messiah. And, and if, you, if that's all you knew of the story, and I were to ask you the question, so who do you think this God-man, the Messiah, who do you think he spent most of his time arguing with? I think most of us, if that's all we knew of the story, would say, well, those that are far from God. I mean, we, we would think that he spent most of his time arguing with, 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 with pimps and prostitutes and liars and cheaters and murderers and politicians. See how he slid them in there in that list? <laughs> I'm just kidding, kind of. <laughs> we, 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 we would think that that's, that's who Jesus is going to spend most of his time arguing with, those people that are far from God. But that's not who he spent most of his time arguing with. It was the religious elite of his day the pastors of his day, if you will. So in John chapter 8, verse 44, we're in the midst of this argument that Jesus is having with these religious elite, and he says this, you belong to your father, Jesus is talking to the religious leaders, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Have, have you ever witnessed an argument going on a debate that's going on and someone says something, someone drops a line where all of a sudden it goes silent in the room like all the oxygen is sucked out of the room like, oh. I think that may have been how it felt because you have to understand these men that Jesus is saying this to, these are the most powerful men in their society from a religious perspective, but not just from a religious perspective. In many ways, from a political perspective, these are some of the most powerful men in that society. And Jesus looks at them and says, you belong to your father, the devil. <laughs> but I want to focus on what he says next. Because now he's going to explain this devil this real enemy that you and I have, this enemy that is hell-bent on destroying us. Look what he says about him. Keep reading in verse 44. He says, He, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is... How much truth is in him? None. There is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar, the father of lies. It's all he knows. It's his native language. He lies, he lies, he lies, he lies, and he is hell-bent on destroying you and me. The, the, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, and he's going to do that with his lies. I've heard it said that sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And the devil, our enemy, he'll never tell us that. When he tempts you and me, when he tries to get us to do these things or think these things, he's never going to tell us that this is probably going to take you farther than you want to go. It's probably going to keep you longer than you want to stay. It's probably going to cost you more than you want to pay. He'll never tell you that. You know why? Because he's a liar. He'll lie about your past. He'll lie about your present. He'll lie about your future. He'll lie about your past by telling you that what you've done in the past, the mistakes of the past, will disqualify you for what God has in the future. He'll lie about your present by trying to convince you to get so focused on the momentary pleasures of this world that you quit thinking about your future. He'll lie about your future and he'll get you to worry, 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 worry so that you're no longer even living in the moment. He'll lie about your past. He'll lie about your present. He'll lie about your future. You know why he'll do that? Because he's the father of lies. It's his native language. It's all he knows. He lies, he lies, he lies because he is hell-bent on destroying you and me. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But one of his greatest lies... One of his greatest tactics with you and me 
is when it comes to our identity. Because he knows when it comes to identity theft, it will affect how we see ourselves, how we see others, and ultimately how we see God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a phrase in just a moment. And just so you are aware, last night I gave this phrase and no one did anything. They all just sat there and looked at me. So here's the phrase. If you don't know whose you are, you don't know who you are. Okay, we'll, we'll try it again. We'll try it again. If you don't know whose you are, you don't know who you are. <laughs> oh, and here's why you should be cheering. Here's why you should be saying amen. Here's why you should be going, yes, yes, because there's so much truth in that. If you don't know whose you are, you don't know who you are. And the devil knows that, and he's your enemy and not my enemy. And that's why he's going to fight so hard to, get, to, to lie to you about your identity, because he knows it affects how you see yourself, how you see others, and how you see God. If you don't know whose you are, you don't know who you are. Which is why now we're going to jump and, and, and take this little trip through history, 5,000 years of history, to, to try to remind ourselves what does God say about our identity so we can fight these lies from the devil. But before we do that, we need to do a little word study. <laughs> yeah, I remember English class when they said, hey, we're going to diagram sentences or do a word study. You're like, oh, no. But I promise, I promise this is going to be interesting, okay? We need to do this. We need to do a little word study because this, this, the Bible, this was written to people from a different culture, a different time, in a different language. And if we don't understand that sometimes, we miss the depth of it. How many of you have traveled internationally? Raise your hand. How many of you? Okay, quite a few of you have traveled internationally. You understand that when you go to another country, sometimes they have a different worldview. They see things through a different lens. They, they have a different culture. They even have a different language. And if we don't get that, we miss some of the depth of this. So here's the word study. It's, it's a simple word. Name. The English word name. Now for you and I in our culture, in our society that we live in, if someone were to come up and ask our name, they're really only asking about what's your title. So they'd come up and say, what's your name? And I would say, Patrick. And then they will usually in our culture follow it up by saying, and what do you do? Because in our culture, our identity is tied more to what we do than who we are. But that's not the way it is in many cultures, including the one the Bible was written in. See, who you are, your family name, had more to do with your identity sometimes than what you did. And this word, oh, this word. The Older Testament was written in Hebrew. There's about 18,000, I've shared this before, there's about 18,000 words in the Hebrew language. Compare that to English with 100,000. 100,000 words to 18,000 words, that means every word in Hebrew is going to have a deeper meaning, a fuller meaning. It's going to be layered. So whenever you read, this should transform when you read the Older Testament. Now, every time you read the word name in English, the Hebrew word that's being used is Shem. Now, you'll see it on the screen. Shem actually refers to a person's reputation or authority or identity. So again, don't miss this. When we ask, what's your name, we're simply meaning, what is your title? But in a lot of places, name or Shem in Hebrew is tied to someone's reputation, authority, or identity. Maybe I illustrate it this way. This might help us. In the 80s, a miniseries came out called Roots. Uh, they redid it in the last five years or so. Some of you may remember it. It, it, it spans 100 plus years of a part of American history that we should be ashamed of, a slavery and, and Roots actually starts, the beginning of the miniseries starts with a, an African chief named Kunta Kinte. And they capture Kunta Kinte in Africa. They put him on a ship. They send him across the Atlantic Ocean. He's delivered here as a slave in America. And they keep trying to break him. But he is, he is, he is a man of, of pride. And, and he doesn't speak very much English. But he'll keep standing up when they try to break him. And he'll say, I am Kunta Kinte. And he's connecting himself to his identity as an African chief. But there's a part of the film that I remember watching as a young boy and it broke me. 
I remember sitting on the couch and watching this scene and there were tears pouring down my face and even as a young boy, I remember thinking in my mind, I will never stand by and let something like that happen. I will never stand around and watch injustices like that and not do something. Because in this scene, they take Kunta Kinte and they tie him to a post and they strip his shirt from his back and all the other slaves are watching this and other slave owners are watching this and a man picks up a whip and he begins to whip him over and over and over again. And finally, he stops and he's out of breath. And breathless, he says to him, Master gave you the name Toby. Say it. Say my name is Toby. And he'd pull himself up on that post and he'd say, I am Kunta Kinte. And so the man would step back again and he would whip him over and over and over again. And again, breathless, he'd stop and he'd say, Master gave you the name Toby. Say it. My name is Toby. He pulled himself up again. He said, I am Kunta Kinte. And he stepped back again and he whipped him over and over. And this exchange went back and forth again and again and again until finally the final scene where he's just, Kunta Kinte now is, is laying on the ground and his back is shredded and he's in a pool of blood. And once again, the man has beaten him. And, and finally, the man stops and once again, he says, Say it. The master gave you the name Toby. Say it, my name is Toby. And this time, with hardly any life left in him, you hear that man lying in the pool of his own blood, and he mumbles these words, my name is Toby. And it breaks you. They weren't just changing his title, were they? See, when they were saying, you're not Kunta Kinte, you're Toby, they weren't just changing his title. They were changing his reputation, his authority, his identity. They're saying, you're no longer Kunta Kinte, the great African chief, you're now Toby the slave. And that's the same thing that our enemy is doing with you and I. We have an enemy, the devil, who's like that man holding the whip and beating him over and over again. And he's trying to convince you that you have a different identity. Because he knows that your identity is tied to how you see yourself, how you see others, and ultimately how you see God. If you don't know whose you are, you don't know who you are. So let me just show you a few verses with this word Shem. It's translated English, name. I hope it transforms how you read the Older Testament. Every time after this, when you read the word name, I hope it changes how you see that. So watch this. In Micah chapter 4, verse 5, it says, All the nations may walk in the name or Shem or the reputation or authority or identity of their gods, but we will walk in the name Shem of the Lord our God forever and ever. See, it's not just title, so watch this again. Other nations may walk in the reputation, authority, and identity of their gods, but we will walk in the reputation and authority and identity of our God. See, isn't that much better than just a title, a name? Okay, watch this. Another good one, Proverbs 18, verse 10. The name, Shem, of the Lord is a fortified tower. The reputation of the Lord, the authority of the Lord, the identity of the Lord is a strong tower, which is why the righteous run to it and are safe. Let me show you one more. Psalms 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the, in the name, in the Shem, in the reputation, authority, and identity of the Lord. Remember when God would change the names of people? He changed Abram. He changed Sarah. He changed Jacob. He changed Peter. Was he just changing their title? Was he just making it a pain for them when they went to the DMV to get a driver's license and now they have a different title? No, it was much deeper than that, wasn't it? So when he says, Abram or Sarah or Jacob or Peter, I'm changing your name, I'm changing your Shem, I'm changing your reputation, I'm changing your authority, I'm changing your identity. This is who you were, but this is now who you are. And we have an enemy who is hell-bent on destroying us. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And one of the main ways he's going to do that is he's going to try to steal our identity. He's going to lie to us about our identity because he knows it's tied to how we see ourselves, how we see others, and how we see God. If you don't know whose you are, you don't know who you are. So now we're going to jump into this, this history, and we're going we're to run through in the next few minutes 5,000 years of history. You ready? 
You ready for this? Okay, this is so good. Stay with me, okay? Go back 4,500 years in history. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. God is speaking to a man named Abraham. Watch this. He took him, meaning God took Abraham outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. So here's what God does. God says, Abraham, come outside of the tent. Abraham goes outside the tent. Look up at the stars. He sees the Milky Way galaxy. He sees millions of stars. And he says, Abraham, that's how many descendants I'm going to give you. Now hold on to that story because if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're connected to that story. If you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, part of your identity is connected to that story that took place 4,500 years ago. Fast forward 1,500 years to a guy named David, King David, 2 Samuel chapter 7. And in verse 12, 2 Samuel 7 verse 12, God speaking to David says, When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. So he's saying, David, you're going to die, but I'm going to raise up your son Solomon, and he's going to be the next king. And you go, okay, so... What does this have to do with us 3,000 years later? Keep reading. Skip down to verse 16. God's still talking to David, and he says, David, your house and your kingdom will endure how long? Forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So God is saying, David, through your lineage, I am going to one day send the Messiah, and the Messiah is going to set up a kingdom that is going to last how long? Forever. Hold on to that story. Because if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're connected to that kingdom. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, your identity is connected to that story. Fast forward now from, from, from this story with David about 600 years to a guy named Daniel. Daniel, God allows him to see the heavens open and he sees the throne room of God in this vision. But Daniel sees something in this throne room that confused the rabbis, the teachers, for hundreds of years after this. So, so stay there in the 600 years after David. We have Daniel. Now we're going to jump forward in time about 600 years. A guy named Jesus. Stay with me here. A guy named Jesus comes to earth, and he begins to publicly proclaim himself as the Messiah. He used a lot of titles for himself, but the title he used more than any other title was the Son of Man. 81 times in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John... He will refer to himself as the Son of Man, by far and away more than any other title. Now, when I used to teach, I errantly taught that that was a display of Jesus' humility. He was connecting himself to humanity. Certainly, Jesus is the most humble person that ever walked this earth, but he was not connecting himself to humanity. He was connecting himself to Daniel chapter 7, because he was speaking to predominantly Jews, and they would have understood this. Watch this. Daniel 7, verse 13. Daniel sees the heavens open. He sees a vision of the throne room of God. And he says, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a... <gasps> what? It, the heavens open. There's a vision. He sees. Keep reading. It says, coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days. The ancient of days is God Almighty. He sees God Almighty, but one like the Son of Man is in the throne room of God. And the rabbis, for hundreds of years after this, struggled with who is the Son of Man? Who is the Son of Man that's in the throne room of God? And the mystery deepens with the next verse. Look at verse 14. This is so good. He, meaning the Son of Man, was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. How many nations? All nations and peoples of every language. Wait, whoa, hold on. Every devout Jew, and if you're a Jesus follower, you should know, worship belongs to God and God alone. This is what confused the rabbis for hundreds of years. If Daniel were to see the throne room of God and he sees God Almighty and one like a son of man shows up, but every tribe and nation is bowing to worship him, worship belongs to God and God alone. 600 years later, Jesus shows up on the, the scene and again and again he says, I am the, I was the one in that throne room. 
Because he's God. Okay, hold on to that story, that vision, because if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're connected to that, your identity is connected to that. Fast forward now, after Daniel, a little over 600 years, Jesus has died, he's risen from the dead, he's ascended into heaven. Decades have gone by, the Jesus followers are exploding in growth all over the Roman Empire. A guy named Paul starts to write letters to Jesus followers all over. He writes one to the Jesus followers in Ephesus, we have it in our Bible, it's called Ephesians. And he's going to talk about a mystery. How many of you love mysteries? Okay, there's a few of us. The rest of you, I guess you can sleep for the next few minutes. Those of us that like mysteries, he's going to tell us there's a mystery that God has revealed. I love mysteries, so this gets me excited. Ephesians 3 verse 2. Paul says, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the the mystery. Yeah, you got to whisper it like that. The mystery made known to me by revelation. So Paul is saying, there's a mystery that you've all been wondering about, and God revealed it to me. Now, if you like good mysteries, you should be sitting there going, well, tell us. What is it? What's the mystery? Tell us. Skip down to verse 6. This mystery is that through the gospel, the gospel is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, This mystery is that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Now, I can tell that some of you are not that impressed. So let me explain a little further. A Gentile is anybody that's not a Jew. So I would guess that probably most all of us in here are Gentiles. These promises that I just went through that were made thousands of years ago were made to Abraham and the Jewish nation. But 2,000 years ago, Paul says, because of what Jesus did, the great mystery is that now if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you as Gentiles are fellow heirs to those promises. What? Okay, so, so there's still some of you that are going, okay, flip back to Ephesians 1 verse 3. Maybe this will help you. In Ephesians 1.3, Paul writes, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every? Every spiritual blessing? Every? You and I? Our identities, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, it means we have been blessed with how many? Every spiritual blessing. Now let me put these stories all together. Let me weave them together. 4,500 years ago, God takes Abraham outside of his tent. He says, look at all those stars. I'm going to give you descendants that number that. And if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're one of those stars now. About 1,500 years later, God goes to David and he says, David, in your lineage, I'm going to send a Messiah, and that Messiah is going to set up a kingdom, and that kingdom isn't like an earthly kingdom. That kingdom will last forever. If you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are now part of that kingdom. About 600 years later, Daniel has this vision, and there's this son of man that is receiving worship that only God should get. And 600 years after that, Jesus comes along and he says, I am the son of man. And a few decades after that, Paul is saying, you want to know this great mystery? Is that if you're a Gentile, you're not left out of these promises anymore. You can now receive every spiritual blessing from God. Wow. That's part of our identity. And oh, that we would get that because we have an enemy, the devil, who is hell-bent on destroying us. The thief came to steal, kill, and destroy, and one of his main ways that he'll do that is to lie to us about our identity. Let let me pull all this together, and maybe this will help us. So about two years ago, I was up in the middle of the night. It's where I end up writing most of my messages. I struggle with insomnia. But on that night, I was actually reading a book about identity, the very thing we're talking about today. And the, the woman author, she was explaining what I did earlier, that, that we struggle with the word name or identity in our culture because we see it differently than most cultures. So she said, this may help. You'll see it on the screen. She said, next time someone asks you your name, maybe respond this way, and it'll help you see it the way most uh, cultures see it. She said, answer it this way. Say, I am, give your first name. From the clan of. 
<laughs> yeah, try that today, see how it works. <laughs> I am Patrick from the clan of McCullough. Okay. <laughs> right? But, but, but it helps us. She was trying to help us understand how a name, Shem, was tied more to reputation, authority, and identity. But two years ago, I read that in the middle of the night, and actually, it just brought me grief. Let me explain. See, I did a little bit of research on my name, and actually, McCullough is Scottish. It's from the McCulloch clan. The McCulloch clan came through Ellis Island, and they dropped the CH to try to make it easier, and so now we're the, the McCulloughs. But when I read that, I was so excited. I'm like, yeah, Scottish. I'm like William Wallace, you know, Braveheart, yeah. And then I, I investigated, and I saw I only have a little bit of Scottish, actually. But then I found out I have a little bit of Native American in me, and I was like a little bit of Cherokee in me, and I was like, yeah, I'm like a Native American chief, woo! But I explored it a little more, and I found out I only have a little bit of Cherokee in me. And then I have a relative, an aunt, who actually dug into Ancestry.com, and she found out that hundreds and hundreds of years ago, there's some English in me, and actually English royalty. I'm in the line of English royalty. And I was like, yeah! Till I found out I only have a little bit of English. <laughs> and then I found out I have a little bit of Scandinavian, I have a little bit of German, and I was left that night with an identity crisis. I don't even know who I am. <laughs> uh, I'm like some mutt. <laughs> but it got worse. Because as I sat on the couch in the middle of the night, and I went through that process of saying, I am Patrick of the clan of McCullough, and I won't go into the details, but my family situation blew up. And I, I sat there going, I don't even know if I'm proud of my name. Not only do I not know who I am, but I don't, I don't even know if I am Patrick from the clan of McCullough. And then I was overwhelmed with the truth of what we're looking at today. Two years ago, as I sat there in the middle of the night on the couch and the tears started pouring down my face, and I realized the truth of my identity. I am Patrick from the family of Abraham, from the family of David, from the family of Yeshua, Jesus. And I am part of a kingdom. I am part of a kingdom that will never end. I am a prince. I am a child of God. I am a son of God. That's who I am. Yeah. Oh, thank God for this truth. And you, you, the same promise is given you if you put your faith in, and trust in Jesus. But we have an enemy who will lie to us. He'll lie to us about our identity because he knows it affects how we see ourselves, how we see others, and how we see God. If you don't know whose you are, you don't know who you are. Let me, let me finish with this quick story. So years ago, I was working in the field of anti-human trafficking. And one day I was, I was interviewed on the news with a woman who had been a former prostitute and a, and a former stripper. And as we're being interviewed, I could tell there was something more to her story. And so after the interview, I went to her, I took her aside, and I said, hey, tell me more of your story. And she said, well, I'm a Jesus follower. I'm like, I knew it. I knew it. I could tell. I could tell. But I'm like, tell me, tell me how that happened. Tell me the story. And she said, well, years ago, I was working as a stripper and a prostitute, and one night, a, a woman came into the strip club that I was working, and she, she brought a, a CD, and she handed me the CD, and she says, listen to this sometime. It's going to tell you who you really are. But that night, after her, or she got off work, she threw it in the passenger seat, and weeks or months went by, and she never watched it. But then she said, uh, one night, she's working as a stripper, and she's on the stage naked in front of a bunch of strangers, and they're throwing dollar bills up on the stage. And she looks around at these dollar bills. And this thought crosses her mind. She said, is this all I'm worth? Is this all I'm worth? She got off work that night. She went and got in her car. And for some reason that night, she took the CD and she put it in the CD player. And she began to hear this woman teach her that <laughs> she was created on purpose for a purpose. That she was fearfully and wonderfully made that she is a daughter of the king, that she was created by God, that he never stopped loving her, nor would he ever stop loving her, that she's the head, not the tail, that she's the top, not the bottom. 
And as she sat there, she was so overwhelmed with the truth of her identity. See, the devil wanted her to believe that that was all she was worth, a few dollar bills up on the stage. But her creator wanted her to know that, oh, she's worth far more. And we have an enemy that is hell-bent, hell-bent on destroying us. And one of his main ways is he's going to try to convince us that this is all we're worth. And yet we have a, a God that says, oh, you're worth far more. Here's my challenge for us today, tomorrow, the next day, whenever the first time that it is that someone comes up and they reach out their hand and they said, uh, who are you? Don't go into everything I said today because you'll freak them out, right? <laughs> but maybe just reach out your hand and say, I'm Patrick. Use your own name because that'll be weird too. I'm Patrick. And then smile. You don't have to say it out loud. Just smile really big. Because inside you're saying, I'm Patrick of the family of Abraham, of the family of David, of the family of Yeshua, Jesus. A part of an everlasting kingdom. Son of God, a prince. Remind yourself of who you are. You bow your heads. And listen, quickly before we go, I just, I just need to say this to you that may not know this, Jesus. You've heard me use this phrase again and again. If you've put your faith and trust in this Jesus, these promises are yours. And if you don't know him, oh, please, I beg you, don't leave. Don't leave without putting your faith and trust in him. Why would you not? Why would you not want to experience the forgiveness of all your sins? Why would you not want to have this new identity as a son or daughter of the king to be part of a kingdom that's going to last for all eternity? And so if that's you, I just I want to encourage you right now in your, in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, if you would just agree with me in this prayer. This prayer doesn't save you. You're saved by faith. And right now, would you just cry out to God in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, and just say, God, I don't want to live life anymore without you. And Jesus, I want you as my Savior. I want the forgiveness of my sins. And from this moment on, I want to be called your son or daughter. From this moment on, I want to have a new identity. I want to be, be part of this kingdom that will last forever. And so right now, I accept you as my Savior and Lord. For the rest of us, would you just agree with me in this simple prayer? For all of us, would you just agree with me in saying this? Thank you, Father. Thank you. <laughs> what else can we say to you when we stand here in awe of the fact that we are your sons and daughters? Thank you. We love you, Jesus. Amen.